Hi, I'm Shannon Steimel, Library Media Specialist at Live for Life Academy, a nonprofit public charter school in St. Louis, Missouri. We serve a high poverty population, and I'm here to talk to you today about digital equity. If you would like the slides to this presentation, you can find them at the short link listed here. So when we're thinking about the digital divide, there are many issues involved. Let's watch a short video from a documentary that was produced in conjunction with Verizon about digital divide. The way that our robots work is we have code on a laptop that we can then download onto the brain of the robot here. Today in school, I don't think I will use a computer at all. Our hopes for the future are very technology dependent. Not having internet has been difficult because most everything is internet based. So there's a lot more stress on the students to find a way to actually do their homework. It's just exciting knowing that I'm going to go to college, like my dream is coming true. We grew up living poor. We want to see what it's like to have a chance. So you can find more about that documentary and uh, the link for uh, scheduling a screening at digitaldivide.com. So when we're talking about digital divides, there are three main areas that we're looking at. Access at school, access at home, and the new digital divide of how tech is used. When the Future Ready initiative was launched in 2015, one of the things that they wanted to ensure was equitable high-speed internet access. And so that robust infrastructure and access both at school and at home was a key part of the Future Ready framework. But they also realized that getting the devices and the broadband into the schools and at home wasn't enough in order to truly prepare students for the 21st century skill set that they needed. It would be essential to provide professional learning for teachers so that they're integrating technology effectively. And so this new digital divide um, is the idea that it's not just about having the access, but what you're doing with it, the computers. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. First though, let's talk about the other two issues, access at school and access at home. So the future ready resources that are available for this issue can be very helpful. There are case studies, webinars, podcasts, uh, link to the digital equity toolkit, and you can find that all at the link that's listed here. As far as access at school goes, we've made great strides. According to the Education Superhighway State of the State reports, there are a lot more kids connected at schools, and in fact, 98% of schools are now taking advantage of digital learning. That leaves about 2.3 million students that are left to connect at school. Um, but the FCC is not content with just getting kids onto broadband. They actually have set new goals for school districts that are about um, how many uh, megabits are available for students. So we've got to keep striving for that. It, currently about a third of the schools are meeting those new standards for the speed of the internet. In terms of access at home, we've got to do something about closing the, the homework gap. And so here's what we've been doing at Lift for Life Academy. Lift for Life Academy, an independent nonprofit charter school, has partnered with Innovative Technology Education Fund, a charitable foundation that holds an FCC license for education broadband channels in St. Louis. Through this partnership, we're able to provide 50 Chromebooks and 35 Wi-Fi hotspots high school students can check out overnight from our school library. This program has been a game changer for our students who don't have access at home. To me, having the Chromebook is useful because 
we are able to complete homework and uh, online assignments and classes such as Khan Academy and it's been very useful and helpful to me because I've been able to complete all of my work with no troubles and I have accessible Wi-Fi with the Chromebook hotspot. This program has allowed us to close the homework gap at our academy. According to Pew Research Center analysis, nearly one-third of low-income American households with school-aged children do not subscribe to broadband service at home, creating a homework gap where students may have access to tech at school, but not at home. It, it really helps me more because like, at home, we don't got Wi-Fi, we don't got a computer, and then I'm able to check one out. So I thank this life for having us get that chance to do that. The addition of the Chromebooks and Hotspots this year has been I can't even explain how vital it has been to our student success. When they would be assigned a paper or any type of homework that would require a computer, you could see just the dread coming over them because they knew they weren't going to be able to get it done. And now they feel confident, they feel empowered to be able to do this on their own. Um, there's always kind of a race at the end of the day to see who um, can, can get them first. They all are like, it's very important to them that they get downstairs and that they are able to check out these Chromebooks before uh, they get on their buses. Uh, I, I particularly teach a uh, college class through SEMO and all of this is online. Students have to have access to a computer and the internet pretty much on a daily basis in order to be successful in that classroom and a lot of the students that I have in there don't have one at home. So um, them being able to check out these Chromebooks has made it possible for them to get college credit as a senior in high school. So it's really putting them a step ahead of a lot of seniors their age. Because students only check out the Chromebooks when they need them, we've really been able to stretch our resources with just over half of our students taking advantage of the program in its first year. It's especially helped students who have online classes. I think our Chromebooks that you all gave to us really helped a lot because I have two online classes. That's on ingenuity, that's with personal finance, math, and biology. It helps a lot for me to get my credits that I've been missing from last year. Besides homework and online classes, taking the Chromebooks home has allowed our students to research and apply for college, scholarships, and jobs, a great benefit, especially to our upperclassmen. Having the computers here at the school has helped me out a lot in many ways because I'm a senior here and I have a job and I also do sports, so it's not always easy for me to stay after school and get access to having the computers. So with the computers being able to be taken home, I get to do my work or do my extra homework that I have online or essays that I have for college or college scholarships and applications. I have the help to fill out those and research resources to help me out with school. So in that way, it has impacted me a lot as a senior. We got the Chromebooks, so we can take them over um, at home and do the work that we need to do because it's really helpful. I got a lot done on my ingenuity online classes. Um, I'm just grateful to have it. I, got, I caught up with some of my credits and my grades, so I'm thankful for that. Um, so what I've seen since we've gotten the Chromebooks for the students to take home is definitely um, it's helping uh, impacting like homework doing there for math wise we do Khan Academy which is an extra practice that the kids can do outside of the classroom and the kids are being able to get it done at home now um, I also seen just a little bit more responsibility with I need to go talk to Miss Samuel about getting a Chromebook um, the kids are talking about how they need a Chromebook for English about writing their papers or the seniors are doing resumes in the college uh, classes. So I've definitely just seen a bigger push for doing work outside of the classroom, which is a huge help to us teachers. Thanks to the support of Innovative Technology Education Fund, we were able to close the homework gap at Live for Life Academy High School by over 2,000 hours for first semester. Uh, the ITEF uh, support and grant, more specifically, has provided access uh, and resources to our school, more specifically our students, in terms of uh, Chromebook technologies, uh, internet connection that they wouldn't normally have access to. This has been of tremendous support to our teachers. Uh, it's been of tremendous support to the students themselves. We simply wouldn't be able to have the type of educational program that we would want without the community support of ITEF and what they've been able to provide us with this school year.
thank you, donors. Um, the uh, Chromebooks have helped me with um, improving my grades, and my grades are vital to my success. This program is just one of the ways that we are working to ensure digital equity for our students, and we're grateful to the Innovative Technology Education Fund for their support. So not every school is lucky enough to get a huge grant like we did, and eventually we will have to come up with our own funding for the hotspots, so there are some resources for that. Um, so I've got some links here for some of the different programs. Um, Kajit is one that a lot of people use, and there's also the um, Digital Wish Mobile Beacon program that Sprint has. Um, and if you need devices and Wi-Fi, um, you might look at the One Million Project. Um, so these are all some really great options. So um, I connected with uh, Joe, who we're going to hear from next, uh, about his using Kajit on the ISTE PLN for digital equity. And so he's going to tell us a little bit about um, how they use this. So um, could you please introduce yourself um, for us? Yeah, my name is Joe D'Amato. I am the Director of Instructional Technology and Pupil Services at DePue Union Free School District. It's a suburb outside of Buffalo, New York. Wonderful. Um, so I know from the ISTPLN that you use Kajit. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you started using it? Okay. Um, three years ago, we went one to one in our district, K to 12, um, and deployed 1,700 devices. And we immediately had a concern with um, wireless access at home for many of our families. We have about a 50% interest rate so we have a lot of needy families so we started exploring options to provide Wi-Fi at home great um, so you had mentioned too that you also use them on your buses could you tell me a little bit about that um, we we started with three school buses we uh, midway through our first year one-to-one -one, we retrofitted three school buses with um, the Kajit Wi-Fi hotspots and by the end of, or for school year next year, we should have 31 out of 53 of our buses with wireless access for our students on school devices. Great, and so how has this helped your students having the Wi-Fi on the buses? Um, well, it, it allows our students to um, use our learning management system uh, to complete homework assignments, um, little entertainment purposes, uh, the focus started with our, our, our athletes, you know, as they travel to away games. You know, that's a lot of time out of their day going to and from games. So it gave them an opportunity to engage with schoolwork. Um, and that was the whole reason, was to, was to make sure that we gave them as much access as they could to, to help them be successful. That's great. Um, so then you also uh, do check them out to some students. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, quite a large uh, free and reduced population. How did you decide which students would get to check out the uh, devices? Um, so we, we have devices for students in grades 6 to 12. Our K to 5 don't take their Chromebooks home. Um, so we don't check them out in the library. I check them out. Um, and it's based on the student need. And uh, what we do is, if a name is brought to us either by a parent or a student or a teacher, uh, you know, I, we, we check to make sure they're on the free lunch list because they should have a demonstrated need. Then I have a conversation with the family and I offer them assistance. Um, amazingly enough, I would say more than half the families turn it down, claiming they have Wi-Fi or they have a plan. Um, and so we have about, a dozen devices out right now with students um, and it gives them assistance. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, so how, how has this fit into your budget? Um, our, our technology director incorporates um, the Kajit data into his budget um, and it's the data rolls over so that's a good, good thing. We don't always use our maximum. Um, the, the buses Kajit um, comes out of, it's paid through the, the bus garage's budget, but um, it's part of the bundle that we get from, uh, that we get from Kajit. So we have one big bundle, part of it's paid through the bus garage, 
that comes out of our technology budget. So how would you say that this has made a difference in terms of digital equity at your school? I think it gives our, our, our families that are, uh, have financial need um, a little bit of a respite from an from a extra expense. And it, it gives our students the support they need at home to do the work we expect them to do with the with our LMS and you know with the one to one we have a lot of expectations for doing things at home um, and it's so much better than sending a kid to Walmart or Starbucks to sit and use the Wi-Fi there for sure well it sounds like a great program Joe thank you so much for uh, telling us about it well you're welcome I'm glad I could be a part of this So the good news is that we may not have to worry uh, too much longer about um, this need for providing Wi-Fi at home, um, at least for um, a majority of our students. So um, one thing you might not realize is the FCC um, has a program called Lifeline that was um, originally providing uh, phones at a low cost for um, low income families, um, but they've actually recently changed that program to include um, the internet as well, low cost internet. So um, the this first link will not take you to the FCC site, it'll actually take you to the Lifeline program. Um, and that's the link that you can share with your families um, where they can go in and do searches um, to, to find uh, companies in your area that are participating in the program. And so um, you do have to meet some qualifications to um, be able to participate in that, um, such as getting Medicaid or SNAP um, benefits. Um, but that is just a really helpful resource. And I think one thing that the school, that us uh, educators can do is to, to try to um, promote this to our families who may not realize um, that this is now available. Um, another government program is um, HUD has started Connect Home. So just like we have Connect Ed um, initiative to get the broadband in the schools, HUD is trying to work to get broadband into uh, low income housing. And uh, so those are two really great initiatives um, that hopefully we'll see um, some great results from and, and to help uh, close this gap at home for access. Um, I also just got a few other links there um, of some of the, the different uh, companies that have programs like these already um, before Lifeline had been put into full effect. Um, and that, that last link, PCs for People, is helpful if you don't have a one-to-one -one program or you don't allow students to, to take their, their Chromebooks home, um, that, that can actually provide uh, a computer and the Wi-Fi access. Um, so you might want to check that out. So um, I hope that this has got you thinking about what you can do in your district. Um, a recent survey showed that 75% of school admins say they do not currently have a plan for how to, to close the access gap at home. Um, so it's something that I think that we really, you know, we, we need to do this to do right by our kids um, and, to, and to ensure that digital equity. Um, so what are some first steps that you can do? So mapping the issue in your district is key. And I mean that literally as in like, you know, on a map, kind of figuring out where those Wi-Fi deserts are for you. Um, and I also mean that, you know, surveying your families can be really helpful. And when you do the survey, you need to be careful about how you ask the question about access, because, you know, some people may have a Wi-Fi hotspot that they can get through their phone, but that's kind of limited in, in terms of the amount of data that they can have. Um, so, so, um, you know, you want to be sure to ask about um, actual like broadband and um, when you're asking about devices, make sure that they're not um, counting just the cell phone. Because while you can do a lot on your cell phone, um, if you've ever tried to uh, edit slides on a slide on your phone, you know that that's difficult or uh, imagine trying to uh, type out a college essay and make it perfect on a phone. That's not going to be easy. So, you know, we really want kids to have access as to devices that are gonna let them do things um, that they wanna do uh, and not be limited. Um, finding community partners can be very helpful. And so, you know, when you're mapping your district, you can also think about like, um, you know, some communities have actually made little signs that, that, that uh, businesses can put up that say that they're homework partners, um, you know, and, and 
let families know that they are welcome to come in and use the Wi-Fi so their kids can do their homework if they, if they need to. Um, you know, and if you're not doing anything at all, I just suggest like pilot something. Even if you can only afford 10 hotspots to check out from the library, that's still going to make a difference. And, and what we found when we started our program is that because we only had kids check out overnight when they needed it, um, we could truly stretch those resources, as I mentioned in the video. Um, so I hope that this has got you thinking about um, how you can address the issue at your school. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of the new digital divide and how tech is used. Um, so a few years ago, I came across this article in my social media feed from EdSearch about um, the discrepancies between technology use in affluent schools and technology use with poor kids. And what they found is that typically um, when devices are put into the hands of students at school who are from low-income families. They are often for remediation, it's drill and practice, maybe a reward, um, games, that kind of thing. And so um, the when you compare this to how technology is used in more affluent districts where students are using the devices to do critical thinking, to do creation, um, that gap between rich and poor actually ends up widening because of the technology if you're not aware of this. Um, so this is something you really need to think about, especially for larger districts too, where um, you know your integration may be uneven in different schools. You don't want your uh, students' experiences with technology to differ just because of their zip code and which school they attend in your district. Um, so this is something that I care a lot about, um, being at a school where um, our students are high poverty. And so I shared this article with our teachers when I found it. And um, as uh, the, the technology committee chair in my district, I'm actually responsible for um, implementing technology PD and um, overseeing the teacher's technology goals. And so one of the things that we did is um, we really thought about like what is going to push the needle for technology integration in our schools and one of the things we've realized it from this information is we've got to be uh creating content creators and not just consumers in our schools in fact um you know the study is getting a little old i need to probably update it but um a 2010 survey of uh IBM of CEOs found that creativity was the most crucial factor for future success. And if you think about that, um, you know, being first to market with things is often how uh, the most successful CEOs are um, being innovative. And so having employees that have that creativity to be able to accomplish this is something that's really a key factor. In fact, you know, when you're thinking about external factors that influence your business, um, this was the number one external factor that they found in that study. And I, I bet if you were to look at a more uh, recent data, it's going to ring true as well. Um, so because we're focusing on this idea of uh, creation, I thought I would uh, take a moment to have you guys think about like and share what are your favorite creation tools. Um, so if you're watching this and you'd like to um, follow the link to my answer garden, you can add uh, your ideas here. You'll see that um, I gave this presentation at the Midwest Education Technology Conference in February. And so the uh, people who attended my conference have already added in their favorite uh, creation tools here um, that they like. So you can check out some of those and then you can add your own ideas if you would like to as well. So here are some of my favorites um, as far as giving students creation opportunities. Um, ThingLink, I absolutely love. I just, the idea of like taking the pictures and then being able to add uh, videos and audio and links and text um, is, can be a really powerful way um, to replace those old poster projects <laughs> that a lot of teachers like to do. So um, please check out some of these ideas that I have. You can follow those links. Um, I know Adobe Spark is one of my colleagues' favorites. She uses it for creating videos and creating presentations. Um, so it's, that's just a, a great tool as well. So um, 
when I finished my master's, I had to do action research and I decided to take this issue of digital equity and the new digital divide to um, help my teachers overcome their personal barriers to technology integration. So I wanted to figure out how can I help my teachers give my students more creation opportunities. So one of the first things I did as part of my research was to conduct a questionnaire with my high school staff. And the questionnaire I used, um, most of the questions came from um, something that had already been created by the Center for Research and Educational Policy at the University of Memphis, and it's called the Teacher Technology Questionnaire. If you follow this link, you'll see, you'll be able to make a copy of the questionnaire that I used. And so to the TTQ questions, I added a few questions about um, creation and how important it was. And I also specifically asked about what the barriers were that the staff saw in integrating technology. And so, you know, I originally did this because I, um, you know, I needed to have data for my action research. But what I realized when I gave the survey was just collecting that information was really powerful because when I got the results, I could see for each teacher what their personal barriers were. And then I could use that information to personalize my PD. So for instance, someone who saw time as their greatest barrier, it's gonna be important for me to make sure that I'm scheduling PD during uh, the, the, the normal PD hours and that I'm, I'm talking to the admin to try to carve out time for that rather than making it something that's after school or during lunch or where they have to give up a plan time all the time to get the technology PD. Um, whereas if someone who um, feels like they don't have the technology knowledge that they need and they're less confident about that, I know that it's important to pair them with a mentor from their department to be able to um, co-plan to integrate technology into their lessons. Um, so um, just doing the survey was extremely helpful in figuring out how to provide better technology PD for my staff. Um, so uh, in addition to the technology survey that I did, um, I also had some archival documents that are referred to, um, the professional learning plans of our staff. and. Uh, also, I had done some surveys um, in previously about the ISTE uh, standards and the essential conditions. So I had kind of background information from the staff on that. The reason why I focused on the, the three years of the professional learning plans is because 2015-2016 is when we adopted the SAMR model. And um, we actually asked our staff to start incorporating the SAMR model into their technology goals to try to help push them toward redefinition. And so um, the, the reason why I think this is really key is because when you look at what redefinition means under SAMR, it's using new, new technology to create new tasks. And it's really student-centered at this point. Um, and students are learning to create products of learning that use technology. Um, and collaboration is another um, really key 21st century skill that's emphasized with this. Um, so you can see from the data that I collected from the technology goals that in the three years that we had been using the SAMR model, um, the number of teacher tech goals that focused on student creation had really increased um, from two out of uh, 11 to six out of 11 in the third year of using the SAMR model. Um, so that's been one way that we've kind of framed our technology PD to get our teachers to think about giving our students creation opportunities. Um, and when we did the survey, we did find that most believed that students should be creators. And so we wanted to figure out like what is holding them back. So when you look at this, you can see like uh, the strongly agree and the agree is, is most of this pie here. So what is it that, that, that's holding them back from doing this? Um, so what are you doing to promote students as creators and not just consumers and what could you be doing? So when, you, uh, when I looked at the literature on the barriers to technology integration, um, these are the main categories um, that I found. Um, you can see that they're in order of relevancy. So for many schools in 2007, um, just the 
access to resources was an issue. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that has gotten much better um, in the last decade. And so that may not be as big of an issue for many, although at my school, we actually found that that was still an issue. Um, and then you can see some of those other factors. And uh, one thing that Hugh pointed out is when you've got a first order barrier that the teacher does not have control over, such as how many um, devices are in the building, that that often, um, you know, they, their attitudes and beliefs are not going to make as big of an impact on that um, if they feel like they have that first order barrier that they can't get around. So that was something we had to address with us. Um, but the, the thing that um, I found in my research is this idea that there are three key factors, and it's teacher readiness, teacher belief, and computer availability, that those three things can have a significant positive direct effect on technology integration. And so that was where I focused um, my research. Um, so you can see for uh, my staff, as I mentioned, that lack of access was, um, and some of our issues with internet connectivity were a barrier, and then the lack of time to implement was um, the other big thing for us. Um, so when I actually um, looked at those, those areas from Inan that he says uh, make the most difference, you can see that my uh, research results from that TTQ, which was a five-point Likert scale. So on that five-point scale, um, most of my teachers um, had a strongly agree for how they felt about their skills. Um, most of them had a, a strong belief in the impact of technology. And then for us, it was that computer availability um, where we lacked and that then um, you see reflected in the actual uh, routine use of technology in the instruction. And so when you look at the individual results, you can see that this kind of plays out individually for teachers. That if you look, uh, you know, someone who rated themselves high, in all of the areas had frequent technology use, whereas um, someone who had rated themselves low had the low technology integration. Um, so one of the things that I did during the study is I actually went through and did follow-up interviews with those teachers that seemed to be outliers where they, uh, especially those teachers who uh, had uh, high scores in their confidence in their own skills and the belief that technology would positively impact them, um, but were worried about the access, but yet still found ways to integrate technology because of those access problems, I wanted to be able to tap into the knowledge of the teachers that were making it happen despite challenges with access. And so what we found is that that why over the how was the key point for them. So um, the teachers who were able to integrate technology despite access challenges, they strongly felt that they needed to prepare their students for um, what they were going to need to be able to do on computers um, for their careers and also for college readiness and that the the why of that was what was key over the how um, and that they would you know they'd figure out a way because they knew that they needed to and so making time and planning ahead were the two key strategies um, that they used um, one thing that also came out of those interviews is the idea that Effective technology integration takes time and knowledge. You can't just do a one and done, um, here's our tech day, and assume that the teachers are then going to use all the tools that they learned about that day. It really has to be ongoing and integrated within what they're doing, and they need to be given time within the PD time that's already there to be able to plan um, effective lessons. And so the implications of the study for Live for Life Academy were to have this personalized PD approach that we were able to do by knowing what their barriers were, to give more time for collaboration, and then to work on closing that access gap that was still an issue for us. So here is what I would uh, say are the key pieces of advice for effective technology integration based on the research that I've done. Um, it focuses on content, um, the effective PD, and so the more content specific the example, the more likely the teacher will see the value of that technology. So um, for instance, you know, giving a math example to a math teacher for technology integration is going to be more powerful to them than seeing an English example and having to think about how that could apply 
to their content area. And so pairing those novice teachers that are not as comfortable with technology to um, someone else who can is more knowledgeable that can mentor them is a really key thing. Um, giving teachers opportunities for hands-on work is key. Um, so not just the sit and get, but actually being able to get their hands in there and try out the tools. Um, and making sure that the, the PD is highly consistent with the teacher's needs. So we don't want the, this to feel like something that's an add-on and just one more thing on their to-do list, but that the technology that they're using is helping them to accomplish their learning goals. Um, and so that just-in-time PD is a, the most influential factor contributing to the teacher's integration of technology into their classrooms. So as we wrap up here, I'd want you to think about like, what are the barriers that does your staff need to overcome for effective technology integration? Um, please consider doing that TCQ survey or something like it. Uh, feel free to take it and make your own. Um, what does your tech PD currently look like? And what is your first or next step in ensuring digital equity for your students? So thank you so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. If you have any questions, um, feel free to tweet at me um, or to follow up with via an email. You can also check out more PD from my website. Um, and if you want to get involved in this conversation about digital equity on Twitter, uh, just use that hashtag digital equity and you'll, you'll start to find some folks um, that you can meet up with. And I also have an ed equity um, list on my Twitter that, of people that I've found that are interested in this issue that you may want to follow as well. Um, so thanks again and have a great day.